Hey there everyone, I'm Isabel Rosales subbing in today for Koi. I hope you're having a tremendous Tuesday and don't forget to submit your hashtag your word Wednesday before tomorrow's show. First up, let me ask you all a question. What do you think about having every Friday off forever? Well, that's what some CEOs are considering for their employees in the U.S. It is called a four day work week and some business leaders are thinking about implementing it to help their employees with burnout or the feeling that some people have that they're overworked and ready to basically give up. Almost a third of large U.S. companies are experimenting with either a four day or a four and a half day work week. That is according to a recent KPMG survey of CEOs. The concerns here are obvious. If people work fewer hours, will they still accomplish the same amount of work? Well, last year, 61 companies in the UK participated in the world's largest trial of a four day work week ever. And a year later, 90% are still using a shortened work week and half have said that they are making that change permanent. These companies say that the new schedules have benefited their ability to recruit new talent and has helped improve people's mental health without sacrificing productivity. But a four day work week may not be the right choice for every industry. For example, in the healthcare sector, where hospitals are having trouble finding enough nurses and doctors to fill open job roles, some employers may not be able to afford to give everyone Fridays off. Next up, we take a look at an infamous day in space travel. February 1st, 2003, when NASA's Columbia shuttle broke apart as it fell back to Earth, killing all seven astronauts on board. The disaster fundamentally changed the way NASA balanced its approach to safety and innovation. Before the Columbia launch, some engineers were concerned about the shuttle's safety, but sadly and catastrophically, they were ignored by management. Now, NASA requires what it calls safety days for its engineers, which means that they have to stop working on their usual tasks just to brainstorm ideas about how to make the program safer. CNN's Kristen Fisher has more about how astronauts today are benefiting from the insights learned from one of the darkest days in space exploration. Hydraulic return instrumentations. Uh, no, sir, there's not. Most NASA astronauts know exactly where they were and what they were doing when the Columbia Space Shuttle disintegrated over Texas, killing all seven astronauts on board. I was actually in high school, I, and I was, um, I was actually in the shower. Don't usually turn on the TV to watch landings with my family, but that day I did. And after a couple minutes, I kind of shoot them and said, hey, you know, guys go outside and play. And it was clear something was not right. Crew six astronauts and cosmonauts return home to Earth. NASA astronauts Stephen Bowen and Woody Hoberg returned to Earth in September after spending 186 days in space. Bowen, the commander of NASA's Crew 6 mission to the International Space Station, knew the Columbia crew. He worked the recovery operations. And he was at NASA when the agency determined that it was a well-known problem with pieces of foam falling from the external tank and striking the shuttle at launch that ultimately led to Columbia's demise. That, that moment really, really hit home. Since then, Bowen has been to space four times, including three shuttle flights. Safety over the past 21 years, um, I think we've, we've worked at it, but it's a continuous process. Launch scrub. That's in work. When Bowen, Hoberg, and two others attempted to launch for the first time in February 2023 on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket and Crew Dragon capsule, they scrubbed with just two minutes left on the clock due to an issue with igniter fluid. We later learned that it was actually a, a NASA person in the room who had made the call not to do that. And I, looking back at it and thinking about uh, that willingness to, to say no, to stop to say, you know, we don't need to launch today. We really appreciated that. And that, you know, that's a, an example of where we've moved a little bit past, hopefully, the things that have gotten us in trouble in the past. Three, two, one. Now NASA is attempting to return astronauts to the moon for the first time since the Apollo program. In January, the agency announced a 10 month delay to the first crewed Artemis mission, citing safety concerns. One area of concern, the Orion spacecraft's heat shield, the same protective tiles that were damaged on Columbia. You know, it was the heat shield for Columbia, but that's not necessarily the next thing that's going to get us. You know, it, it might be something else that we haven't thought of. There is inherent risk in everything we do. And so we have to find ways to make sure that we uh, understand what the risks are and mitigate them, uh, but then actually go fly. 
Kristen Fisher, CNN, Washington. All right, quiz time. You've got 10 seconds. What is the biggest museum in the world? Is it the Louvre Museum in France, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Vatican Museums at the Vatican, or Tokyo National Museum in Japan? The answer is the Louvre Museum in Paris. It covers more than 780,000 square feet and is home to about 38,000 pieces of art. In this next report, we're going to take you to a museum where you can actually touch the art. That's right, the Mercer Labs Museum of Art and Technology in New York City is not your typical museum with velvet ropes and strict security guards. Nope. At this museum, the visitors are actually encouraged to come in and interact with the exhibits. That is because the Mercer Museum houses what is called experiential or immersive art. And as you'll see in this report, it is easy to get lost in all the magic of it. We redesigned this place 50 times till we find the right layout and the right energy and the right message behind every step and every where you go in the space. Each room touches your sense in a different way. The whole goal is for people to really walk through, experience those things, the sight, the smell, the touch, the feel. The main hall, we have uh, 26 projectors. So this room can be transformed to anything we want. You can see a film in 360. You can experience sound in a completely new way. Coming in, you are part of the installation, you are part of the, the art by walking in the space. I try to, to create um, a space that you standing there and you don't know where is the ceiling, you know, where is the sky and where is the floor. We encourage people to come and touch the work and experience everything. You can touch everything, it's, and that's the difference between what we are doing right here and other museums as well. I feel like today people need a little escape. I try to do something that can give hope. Roy has about uh, 50,000 pieces of content that he hasn't released yet, so I think he has enough to keep this place exciting for, uh, for the next uh, thousand years. For today's story, getting a 10 out of 10, do you have a dog? And does your dog use their tongue to loudly lap up their water? In this report from CNN's Ginny Mose, we meet one dog who takes diving into his doggy bowl to a whole new level. Most dogs slurp, but 11-year-old Bella slurped her way to viral fame. She just like romped over and started slurping out of the, um, the doggy bowl. California resident Don Vercelli was on an important work from home video call. And my mom told everyone to be quiet. And then she started slurping, but then she just kept going. Kept going so long that Don's daughter Jessica started recording it. You're hearing my dog. <laughs> Commenters were in awe. Is it her first time having water? I know, I think she had just woken up from a nap. The pit bull probably had a little dry mouth. Commenters had solutions. Note, remember to empty water dish before next meeting. Now there it is. True. There's a good idea. <laughs> Genie Most, CNN. You're hearing my dog. <laughs> New York. <laughs> All right, superstars, now it is time for the shout outs. Our first shout out goes to St. Johnsbury School in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. I see you, Catamounts. And our next shout out goes to the Tigers at White River High School in White River, South Dakota. Thank you all for tuning in. I'm Isabel Rosales. It was amazing spending this Tuesday with you. Koi will be back in tomorrow. Make it a great day.